Hi, I'm Indy Nidell, and this is a Great War special episode about Italian weapons of the First World War. Now, it's not me who's going to be doing most of the talking about these Italian weapons, and it's not Ernie, my Ernie mug. It's going to be our, our good friend over in the United States of America, Otias. Otias, can you say hi and say who you are and what you do? Hi, I'm Otias, and this is the set for CN Arsenal. We have a little YouTube show. And uh, we've been working our way through the weapons of World War I, thanks to our collaboration with the Great War. Uh, so uh, we like to get in here and try to gather as many pieces as we can from one country to give a feel of that country, and then share them with you guys through the Great War. And then over on our own channel, because I know a lot of you are going to say, well, didn't they have this and didn't they have that? Yes, they probably did. The trick is getting them all into one room at one time. And so uh, while these are indicative of the countries, if you want to know more, we are going into fine, fine detail over at our own channel. So if you think, oh, I wish he had said this or I wish he had said that before you comment, come on over and see if we've done the video yet. And then you can let me have it instead of poor Indy. And their channel is truly awesome, actually. And you can get to see people shooting things, mostly May and stuff. But, um, but yeah, so you should, uh, uh, you should go over as soon as you finish watching this and, and look at all the other cool stuff on their channel to get more in-depth stuff about weapons that we certainly don't have time to talk about on our channel. So where do you want to start today? Well, I'm going to start off with the primary arm of Italy, and that is going to be, oh, good lord, what many people will call a monlicker, but it is just the Kakarno 1891 rifle. Now, this is a hefty boy, but not as heavy as you'd think. It's narrow. Uh, it's, like I said, light for its size. It's very simple construction. Looking up close, we are a bolt-action rifle. We use a six-round end-block clip, just like with the Bertier before. This is going to go in and stay in until we chamber that last round, at which point it will fall out this hole in the bottom. Just like with those Bertiers and the Gewehr 88s we talked about, this is going to be a problem for mud entering the action. It's going to make this gun very dirty in the trench, and it's going to keep kind of giving it some problems with cleaning. Although, uh, I haven't heard as many complaints about these guys fouling up with mud as some other designs because they have some pretty loose tolerances to them. Now, uh, the Kakarno is descended from that German Gewehr 88. I mean, you can tell at a glance it, it looks a lot like it. But uh, there are some very unique features. Um, first of all, with the action, if I open her up, uh, we do not have a separate bolt head. We do have one sort of forged bolt body uh, milled out with two front locking lugs. And then we have an unusual safety. It's a little kind of flag style safety. This one is a push and turn to release. Now, this safety comes from an old, old gun, uh, I want to say 1868 is when Cacarno, a uh, native Italian, had redesigned a breech loader conversion. This is back when everybody was trying to turn their muzzle loaders into breech loaders by simple conversions. And so he came up with a uh, derivative of the Baumgarten. It was so far away from the original design, it just ended up being named the Cacarno or the Cacarno ad Argo. Uh, it used a safety similar to this, and what it does is it basically disengages that spring tension on the uh, firing pin so that if we pull the trigger, it won't drop. There's only one real problem with that, which is, as you can see, I can pull the trigger and shove, and it will actually override the sear and go, because it's not physically blocking the firing pin, it's just taking away the spring tension, which makes it not my favorite safety of the First World War, because you could, in theory, hold the trigger and still slam a primer, although it'd be very, very unlikely. I just think it's not as positive as some of the others. Um, the other thing is, as I start to work this bolt, you're going to hear it's a little grindy. There's a little bit of noise going on there. It's a little soggy. Um, shooters who have handled these guys will know they tend to feel a little rough. Um, they're not horribly wiggly. I mean, they're still in original condition. They're still fairly tight. Although as you get to the back, there's a lot of slop so that there's play for the tolerances and for things to kind of not build up in that action. The Kakarno is really sort of the worst of the best for World War I. Um, I don't want to sit here and spit on it from great heights, but this is not one of the prime rifles of the First World War. It worked. It was accurate. Um, it was only as susceptible to mud as some of the other designs with the Monlicker system, so it wasn't outstanding in that regard. But uh, despite all that, it's still very rough. Um, you don't get a, a positive shooting experience out of it as like a casual shooter or anything like that or as a sport shooter. This is going to be the least impressive rifle you see from the First World War. And yet, yet, I have to say, it did work. It functioned just fine. Now, two questions. 
Uh, what kind of range did this have, and was it good as a mountain gun? Was it good in the mountains of the Italian front? If we take a look, we actually are sighted with a fairly good sight. Um, the Kakarno sight's interesting. In this position, I use this rear notch here, which is set for 300 meters, which tends to be the shortest range of any of these guns, which will show you how people thought about range at that time. I mo most engagements are gonna be well below 300 meters, but the lowest setting is 300 meters. And we see this over and over and over again, 250, 300, 400 meters. Well, uh, if I flip this back all the way down, I'm now at 450 meters. And then I can adjust all the way up to, I believe, 2,000 meters. Yes, 2,000 meters on this gun. Now, obviously, at 2,000 meters, it's just volley fire. But the Kakarno is well set for mountain use, but we'll get in that in just a moment, actually. Let me hold off. Um, I will say the 6.5 cartridge, flat shooting, direct shooting, it's, you have what's called, uh, point blank range, which people tend to think of as being close up. But point blank just means the area in which the trajectory of a cartridge will, or a bullet will hit somebody standing from the vital zones, essentially. So you're talking about like knees or crotch up to the shoulder. Um, so if we, you know, we have a man who's close to us, we shoot, it could theoretically go through this man. And if it was undisturbed in its trajectory, it would go high and it would lob low and then there'd be another point blank range at the end where we could possibly hit another man. Uh, that's useful for machine guns and uh, machine guns and beaten zones and stuff, but that's, that's not what we're talking about now. Just for point blank range, the faster and flatter shooting your cartridge, the longer, just like depth of field on a camera, the longer range that you end up hitting exactly where you're pointing within a standard deviation of one human torso. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, yeah, I got it. I got it. That's cool. So if you're crawling mountains and you have poorly trained illiterate troops or something, uh, a gun like this that's shooting a nice flat cartridge means that you get to just sort of point at the guy across the valley and actually hit him. You have your best chance of actually connecting. Um, the only downside is these sites aren't really adjustable for windage. A lot of European sites weren't at that time. It's more the British and Americans that cared about windage adjustments. So you would have to do uh, what's called Kentucky windage which is just sort of adjusting for the wind on your own by aiming left or right. But finely set sights, flat shooting cartridge, this is a decent sniping rifle for mountain use. And it's made better by its overall lightness for its size. This gun, as big as it is, is very light. It's very simple. Um, the number one claim to fame for the Kakarno overall as a system is that it was easy for the Italians to manufacture. They tried to get away from this gun repeatedly. Um, if you check in with Forgotten Weapons, they're still going through a bunch of prototype semi-automatic Italian guns from the 20s and 30s. Uh, they could never get away with it, get away from it, because every time they'd launch into a war, this was the only thing that they could produce in enough numbers, and they made millions of them. So as much as it's sort of the the ugly uh, stepchild or something, it it's it's the only kid you got like you got to go with this one because to switch to anything else became nearly impossible for the Italians and right. still perfectly serviceable I still I would still pretty much bet my life on a Kakarno I know people would laugh at that but I've never seen one not go bang they're just a little grumpy like they're just a little crotchety about what they're doing but they're not horrible guns by any measure so they do work they're just not your favorite if you had to pick a pick so the Kakarno did something else for the Italians, though. Because it's a comparable lightweight, it also set them up for some good ideas. Unfortunately, being Italy, they couldn't always execute those properly, but it doesn't mean that they weren't good ideas. So let me get to a second gun here, and we're going to have a couple Kakarnos, because that's really, like I said, the only gun they were able to make. This is popularly, popularly known as the Cavalry Kakarno. This is the 1891 Moschetto. Like, this is just, they just call it the carbine. They just, it's their short rifle. Um... They didn't think of it specifically as a cavalry gun, although we tend to. Um, part of the reason it has this integral bayonet is so that uh, any troops, and you know, these had fairly long bayonets for the lo uh, long rifles. You don't want that thing clamoring around on your belt if you're the kind of soldier that doesn't need to be frontline infantry. If you're not gonna face a bayonet charge or a cavalry charge, you don't want to have to deal with that slapping around on your side. If you're cavalry men, you don't want that slapping against your sword, you have a sword, you don't need the separate bayonet, um, but you still might want to have a bayonet, so they went ahead and attached it to the gun itself. So this guy folds out, there's a number of different ways that these actually attach over the years. This is one of the earliest ones where you kind of pinch and pull, but later there'll be push buttons, and it's just a simple little uh, cruciform bayonet. 
I'll show it when I get in closer in just a moment. But if you look at this guy, really light, really handy, extremely short, one of the smallest guns of World War I. Um, other than some very special carbines that weren't really frontline things, like, I mean, the, the old German Car 98s before the Car 98 AZ, they get close to this size. But until World War II and the US M1 carbine, you don't tend to see guns this small. Well, that makes this thing extremely handy for trenches and mobile warfare. They would put these things to use not just with cavalry, but with um, bicycle troops and any other special troops that might not want to have a bayonet slapping around, but that's the two you tend to think of. So back in the day, uh, Italy couldn't afford cavalry uh, all the time, like nations could, or even before Italy was Italy. This is back when it was infighting. But they came up with troops that were highly mobile. They were less encumbered than other troops, and they were designed to march, like force march everywhere they went, essentially, to surprise or outmaneuver the enemy, but they didn't have horses. So it's like, uh, we don't have horses, you guys jog and carry less stuff. And so... Those guys were equipped with things like this. Well, you know, with hindsight, we know that in World War I, that's not a bad idea. Highly mobile infantry that's lightly encumbered because they can always be, re you know, reinforced by rail or have reinforcements or reserves brought up. But just move and strike teams, it's a very, very good idea. It's just that it didn't get brought to the war until much later. But this is a pretty good weapon to do that with. And as a matter of fact, they like the carbine format so much that, oh, I'm sorry, let me zoom in on this real quick to show you that bayonet before I go any further. Uh, first things first, we now only have a 1200 meter sight, a little shorter, works the same way, all the way forward, all the way back. And then you can see we have a nice little latch right here, and it's just pull, flip, and she springs back in and locks. And that's that's really it, there's, there's nothing fancy there. Um, and it's just a nice pokey cruciform bayonet. Instead, they'd carry their own knife if they wanted something different. All right, so, um, that covers this. They liked the con carbine concept so much that when they had other troops that they didn't need to give long rifles to, but still might like to use, say, a bayonet, well, they came out with this. This is the Moschetto TS, so another carbine, only this time the TS stands for Truppa Speciali. Speciali? I don't speak Italian. Special troops. And uh, that doesn't mean that they were better, or it doesn't mean that they had special needs. It means that they were uh, anybody that didn't fit the mold. So they're not infantry, they're not cavalry, they still need a bayonet, but they don't need a big old gun. So you end up with this guy, the TS. Now, uh, the TS has its own bayonet mount. Interestingly, through World War I, it's going to have its own proprietary bayonet. This bayonet swings in from the side, and unfortunately I don't have an original to show you. Uh, I just hadn't picked one up yet. But instead of dropping straight in from the front, it actually had to be rotated in from the side so that it was harder to yank off. Uh, I don't know why they were obsessed with this. It's not standard to the way the rifle works, so they couldn't share parts with the long rifle. It seems like a waste, especially in World War I when you're desperate for stuff. That would get fixed later. Later versions of this gun will have a regular rifle bayonet. Um, Otherwise, pretty straightforward gun. I will say one thing. Originally, they were only underslung, so we got an underside sling, underside sling. A lot of guys in the U.S. are going to have this gun or versions of this gun because it was so common. The later versions will have either side slings or both underside and side slings. These don't start happening until the 20s, all the way up to about 1930. Um, so World War I original, they're only underslung. So that tells you something about the thought process. Um, this isn't a gun meant to be carried on the back. It's still going over the shoulder. Uh, they still think of these troops as light infantry of sorts. Uh, they still think of them as not the most mobile guys or mechanized or horse riding guys. So you wouldn't have like the Alpini or Arditas, they wouldn't be using this or? Uh, in the long run, yes, they probably were issued these on occasion. Uh, you'll probably find photos of them with both these and the cavalry style one and the long rifle, it's gonna be whatever they could get, wherever they could get it. But ideally, uh, highly mobile troops would get what is quote unquote the cavalry model. And then this is gonna be more like artillery troops. Artillery is really sort of the quintessential troop for this gun. Um, because they're out in the field, they're considered a combat, you know, they're considered a frontline unit, but they're not, they're not supposed to be using these all the time. Um, and again, very light. These would also become popular with assault troops by the end of the war. So uh, trench taking, the these ended up changing roles to frontline, frontline use because of the ability to sort of move, drop into a trench, and then get around in the trench with a full-size bayonet bladed instead of that little spike. 
and still be able to take your six shot regular rifle. Um, these helped with highly mobile troops. So it's interesting as rough as the Kakarno is, it's one of the best guns of the war in terms of mobility when you take into account these two carvings. Um, these are the lightest, smallest thing you're seeing in the war. They are extremely good for trench warfare. These are definitely, as I'm holding this up, you can tell they're more in line with what we think of the size of a modern combat rifle to be. So in that regard, Italy got it right. And let me tell you something, if I had to pick any gun of World War I that I had to hike with, like if I had to, you know, throw it on my shoulder or back and actually march for days at a time, it would be the cavalry style one in a heartbeat. This is the lightest thing out there. Um, terrifically handy little weapon. And if you're only having to fight a couple times and mostly march, I'll go with it. It's fine. It shoots straight. It shoots reliably. It's not the bell of the ball, but it's still much more versatile than some of the other things we've seen. Cool. Now, uh, as far as praise goes, we have to stop because we need to talk about what Italy also had to do because still limited manufacture. Um, they could not crank out enough Kakarno to meet their needs, just like everybody else. I mean, if Germany can't get enough Mausers, then certainly Italy's not going to get enough Kakarno. They had to reach back in time for their last major service weapon, uh, the Vetterli. So the original, oh, good Lord. The original Vetterli, uh, yeah, take a look at that. The original Vetterli would have had no magazine. Let me get this in the shot. I think I'm in, sorry, I'm going for other recordings. It's a lot to fit in frame. Uh, you guys from the live show can see this a little easier, but a little blurrier. Um, the original Vetterli had no magazine. It was a single shot weapon. Uh, and then uh, Giuseppe Vitali would later in 87 add a four shot black powder magazine to it. This is a big uh, 10 3.5 millimeter black powder cartridge. The bore on these things, you know, you're talking about like a 45 caliber bore. Almost, it's in that range if you want something that you can think of. Um, it's a big bore rifle, and it's a very simple rifle. However, for its time, and again, this is coming out of Switzerland for most of the, uh, the original invention, not the magazine. Um, it's still very advanced because you're talking about 1869, 1870. You have a bolt-action rifle, and I'll zoom in on this, actually. You're talking about a bolt-action rifle with twin rear locking lugs. So there's a locking lug and there's one up under there. And when I bolt this forward and drop, it's got two symmetrical locking lugs on either side of the rear receiver. That is extremely advanced for its time. This is way ahead of its time. It makes it a very strong rifle, which is good because it is no way supposed to be chambered in 6.5, which it now is. So in desperation, Italy would take these guns, they would uh, drill them out so they'd stick a steel rod down the barrel, uh, which again had been 10.35. Now they drill it out for 6.5, which means that this is a incredibly thick steel barrel now. It's a barrel within a barrel. This is one of the heaviest guns in World War I. It's also one of the longest. It is ungodly heavy. Now people will complain about Lee Enfields and things like that. This is way heavier than that. This is a monster. I would not want to have to hike anywhere with this thing. Uh, it uses its old side mount bayonet. Interesting thing, I've been trying to find a set and I haven't found a set yet, but the bayonets for these were extremely long. Uh, they'd be sticking way out in the front. Uh, they were so long that it was deemed unnecessary in World War I, so they took the bayonets, cut them in half, resharpened the one side so that you end up with a short bayonet for the rifle. The other half was turned into a trench knife. And so I've been looking to find a set of those, but I just haven't been able to find both the cut down bayonet and the trench knife. But those are out there. You can find uh, knives made from half a bayonet and a bayonet made from the other half. Uh, if we look oh, back here, what they've done is during the war, starting in 1915, they fitted a standard Kakarno magazine. I mean, that's straight off the Kakarno assembly line and just sort of ground to get rid of the trigger guard. Uh, so this still chambers, this still takes the, uh, the end block clip now with six rounds. It works just like the primary rifle. There's no real difference. Um, except for some minor differences in the old style sights. But uh, if you're an Italian soldier, you're not confused to be given this. These guns were meant to be used by uh, rear line troops and never make it to the front. But as we know, that doesn't always happen. You get overrun. Sometimes they're used in anger. And then after the war, they were put in storage. And Italy was so desperate for arms again later on that these were brought out for World War II. Although mostly they were issued in Africa 
uh, to Ascari's and things like that. This one actually is branded. It's, I probably couldn't get it on either camera without a photo. It's branded AOI um, for the uh, Italian control of East Africa. Um, so we know that this one actually fought all the way through World War II, uh, which is incredible because, remember, the model name for this guy is going to be the Vetterli 70 87 15. And so that means this is a gun that had no magazine, then it was given a four-shot magazine, then that was removed and it was given a six-shot magazine. But that should wrap us up for rifles on Italy, because that's that's pretty much it. They didn't reach out as much as other powers. I mean, they used captured equipment. They'd have a lot of Austrian straight pulls and things like that in inventory. Uh, but realistically, from Italy, you've got the Cacarno, and then you reach back for the last service rifle, the Vetterli, and that's about it. So, very simple construction. Uh, very resourceful in terms of trying to keep material moving to the front. Uh, and again, they had a lot. They fielded a lot of carbines compared to other nations. And these are very, very handy arms for shoot and move tactics. Well, that's all for today. Once again, this was a Great War special episode about Italian rifles during the First World War in association with our very, very close personal friend who we love dearly, C and Arsenal, in the person of Othias and, of course, May. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Yeah, I appreciate it. Always glad to help out. And again, more details at our site. Don't blow Indy up about this, but leave positive comments. Comment all you want, but... The answers are over on our site. It's true, the answers are over on their site, and you should all go and check it out if you haven't already. I don't see why all of our subscribers are not also subscribers to Othias' channel. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to us if you haven't done so, and like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, and we'll see you next time.